What if I told you that an ordinary job could turn into a deadly game of survival involving a pizza delivery man, a bank robbery, and a bomb? You would think this was the plot for a Hollywood thriller, but the events that unfolded on a quiet afternoon in Erie, Pennsylvania, I don't think would show up on a Hollywood script. Join us as we unravel the layers of this perplexing case, exploring the intricate puzzle that truly stunned the rest of the country. But before we get into that, please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss any of our uploads. Now, let's begin our deep dive into the baffling story of the Collar Bomb Heist. On the afternoon of August 28, 2003, in Erie, Pennsylvania, an ordinary pizza delivery turned into a scene straight out of a Saw movie. Brian Wells, a 46-year-old pizza delivery man, entered a PNC bank with a note demanding $250,000 while having a bomb connected to his neck. Wells entered with nothing but a cane and a shocking demand for the bank teller. Wells would reveal the bomb under his shirt when his request was met with hesitation. He would exit the bank with just $8,702 and a lollipop from the counter. He would soon make his escape, but Wells's attempt at escape was short-lived. Within minutes, state troopers detained him in a nearby parking lot, marking the beginning of one of the most mind-boggling bank heists in history. Let's dive into the details of how this unprecedented heist unfolded. Wells informed the police that during a pizza delivery, he was confronted by a group of men who, at gunpoint, secured a bomb to his neck and demanded he rob a bank. Frantically, he would yell out to law enforcement, it's going to explode, I'm telling the truth. Law enforcement immediately contacted the bomb disposal team and prepared for action, taking cover behind their vehicles. As news teams gathered, Wells sat on the ground, anxiously questioning if someone had informed his employer about his predicament, worried about appearing to neglect his work responsibilities. After 25 minutes of tense waiting, the bomb began to beep more rapidly. In a state of panic, Wells attempted to move away from the imminent threat. Then, the bomb went off, forcefully throwing him backward and causing a severe injury. The pizza delivery worker drew his final breaths on the ground, marking 3.18 p.m. The bomb disposal team arrived just three minutes later. The investigation team delved into an array of physical clues. Inside Wells's vehicle, they uncovered a cane that was cleverly modified into a makeshift firearm. Similarly, the bomb was a testament to intricate homemade engineering. It consisted of a metal collar, designed with triple bands and equipped with four keyholes and a combination lock, along with an iron box that housed two pipe bombs, each about six inches in length and was filled with potent smokeless powder. The collar secured around Wells's neck like an oversized shackle and was clearly crafted with sophisticated tools. Additionally, the device incorporated two kitchen timers and an electronic countdown mechanism, alongside wires that served no purpose other than to confuse and mislead investigators. It also featured misleading labels that added to its enigmatic nature. Yet, what interested the investigators the most were the detailed handwritten notes found in Wells' car, directed at the bomb hostage. These notes laid out instructions for Wells to steal $250,000 from the bank, followed by elaborate steps to locate various keys and codes scattered around Erie, presenting a complex challenge. The evidence comprised illustrations, explicit threats, and detailed maps. The notes assured Wells that if he followed the instructions meticulously, he would eventually acquire the keys and the combination needed to unlock the bomb from around his neck. Any deviation from the plan or failure would lead to his death. The instructions were clear. There is only one way you can survive, and that is to cooperate completely. Emphasizing the severity of the situation with the warning, this powerful booby-trapped bomb can be removed only by following our instructions. Act now, think later, or you will die. It appeared that the mastermind behind the heist had designed a daunting challenge for Wells, turning it into a dangerous quest for survival. In the aftermath of Wells' death, the police embarked on the trail laid out by the notes. The initial directive was straightforward. Exit the bank with the money and go to the McDonald's restaurant. Get out of the car and go to the small sign reading, drive through open 24 hour in the flower bed. There is a rock with a note taped to the bottom by the sign. It has your next instructions. Wells took this exact route after departing the bank with the money bag. Wells found a two-page note in the flower bed, instructing him to proceed up Peach Street to a wooded area. Here, a container marked with orange tape was supposed to contain further instructions. Although Wells never reached this point, the investigators continued the search, discovering the container exactly as described. Inside, a note guided them about two miles south to a small roadside sign, where they expected to find another clue in a jar hidden in the nearby woods. Upon arrival, they found the jar, but it was empty. 
it became clear that the orchestrator of this grim scenario had aborted the plan once law enforcement became involved and was likely monitoring their movements closely. Adding to the mystery was Wells's attire at the time of his death. He was wearing two t-shirts, the top branded with the guest logo. This shirt, which he hadn't been wearing earlier that day and was not recognized by his family, seemed to mock the investigators. Can you guess the mastermind's identity? This question added another layer of complexity to the case, leaving investigators puzzled. The purpose behind the elaborate scavenger hunt remains a mystery. Why orchestrate such a complex sequence of events, compelling a hostage to navigate Erie in broad daylight? And why place clues in locations where they might potentially be found? The choice of Wells as the target adds another layer of intrigue. These questions had stunned the community and would capture attention from St. Louis to Sydney, igniting widespread media fascination and initiating a complex investigation. This case, which was already known for its intricate puzzles, introduced the world to the sinister figure known as the Collar Bomber. The FBI's pursuit mirrored the complexity of the bomber's own game, embarking on a seven-year investigation that seemed as meticulously planned as the ordeal Wells endured. The crux was whether the authorities could outmaneuver the Collar Bomber, achieving what Wells tragically could not. The narrative began at Mamma Mia's Pizzeria, marking the start of a fateful day. Wells, a dedicated employee known for his reliability for over a decade, took on a delivery order for two sausage and pepperoni pizzas to a remote area on the outskirts of Erie, despite it being the end of his shift. His commitment was evident. The only time he ever reported late was due to the death of his cat. Departing the pizzeria around 2 p.m., Wells headed to a secluded TV transmission tower site, accessible only via a dirt road, setting the stage for the unfolding drama. In their search of the area, investigators found shoe prints that matched Wells's shoes and tire tracks that were consistent with those of his Geo Metro. However, the site did not reveal any evidence about who might have drawn him there or the events that transpired upon his arrival. The following day, a reporter and a photographer from the Erie Times News went to the tower. Although police blocked access to the dirt road, they noticed a tall, heavyset man wearing denim Carhartt overalls walking in front of a house located adjacent to it. His property stretched nearly to the transmission tower itself. The man introduced himself as Bill Rothstein. Rothstein, who was 59 at the time, was an unmarried handyman who had spent his entire life in the region. He articulated himself with the elegance of someone who valued lingua linguistic proficiency and conversed in French and Hebrew. Seemingly unaware of the significant investigation happening just beyond his property, Rothstein was approached by the journalists, who inquired if they could pass through his yard to get a closer look at the scene. He consented and although they ventured through the dense underbrush, their view remained obstructed. After around 15 minutes at Rothstein's residence, the journalists departed. Rothstein's call to 911 unveiled a chilling revelation. On September 20th, he reported to the authorities that there was a frozen body stored in the garage of his residence at 8645 Peach Street, specifying that it was contained in a freezer. Following his call, Rothstein was quickly detained by the police. He shared with them the turmoil he had been experiencing, revealing that he had contemplated suicide and had even drafted a note outlining his intentions. Found within his home, the note penned in black marker conveyed his apologies to those who had cared for him, identified Jim Roden as the individual in his freezer, but clarified that he had no hand in Rodin's death. Intriguingly, the note began with a statement distancing the incident from the Wells case. Rothstein disclosed to the authorities over subsequent discussions that the corpse came into his possession following a request from Marjorie Deal Armstrong, an ex-girlfriend from the 60s and 70s. This complex web of events further deepened the mystery surrounding the case. Deal Armstrong confessed to Rothstein that she had fatally shot her partner, James Rodin, with a Remington 12-gauge shotgun following a financial disagreement. She then sought Rothstein's assistance to dispose of Roden's body and clean the crime scene at her residence in Erie, which was roughly 10 miles from Rothstein's home. Complying with her request, Rothstein stored Roden's body in a freezer in his garage for five weeks. He meticulously destroyed the shotgun used in the murder, dispersing its parts across Erie County. However, Rothstein admitted he was unable to proceed with her plan to dismember the body. His decision to contact the authorities stemmed from his growing fear of potential repercussions from Deal Armstrong. She was subsequently arrested and charged with Roden's murder. In January 2005, about 16 months after her arrest, she entered a plea of guilty but mentally ill, resulting in a prison sentence of 7 to 20 years. By the time of her sentencing, Rothstein had detached himself from the situation involving his former girlfriend 
having passed away from lymphoma in July 2004. Initially, the federal agents investigating the collar bomb case did not focus on the Roden murder, considering it a separate, local issue unrelated to their investigation. However, in April 2005, a breakthrough occurred when a state police officer contacted them following a discussion with D.L. Armstrong about another case. Contrary to Rothstein's claim in his suicide note, she implicated the murder of Roden as a key component of the collar bomb scheme. Upon meeting with her, the FBI learned she was willing to disclose all she knew about the collar bomb case in exchange for a transfer from the state penitentiary in Muncie to a minimum security facility in Cambridge Springs, closer to Erie. This proposition opened a new avenue for the investigation, suggesting a direct link between the Roden murder and the complex collar bomb plot. Before her arrest for the murder of Roden, she was already a well-known figure in Erie due to her association with a series of deceased partners. Her notoriety began in 1984 when, at the age of 35, she faced charges for the murder of her boyfriend, Robert Thomas. She asserted she acted in self-defense, firing six shots, and was ultimately acquitted by a jury. Further suspicion surrounded her in 1988 when her husband, Richard Armstrong, died from a cerebral hemorrhage under questionable circumstances. Despite the presence of a head injury upon his arrival at the hospital, his death was deemed accidental, and the case would not advance to a coroner's investigation. Deal Armstrong's reputation for intelligence can be traced back to her high school years, and she was admired for her extensive knowledge of literature, history, and law. However, her brilliance was overshadowed by her deteriorating mental health, marked by bipolar disorder, which led to extreme mood swings and uncontrollable bouts of rapid speech. Her behavior was both paranoid and narcissistic. Narcissistic. In 1984, a search of her cluttered home revealed large quantities of decaying butter and cheese. Despite being declared mentally incompetent by psychiatrists on several occasions, it was not until the Thomas case that a judge determined she was competent to stand trial. Deal Armstrong's profile, a mix of murderous tendencies, eccentricity, and a desire to showcase her intellect, made her a prime suspect in orchestrating a complex criminal scheme. Her nature suggested she might not only conceive such an elaborate plot, but also be compelled to share the details of her ingenuity with others. During her encounters with federal investigators, Deal Armstrong seemed to embody this persona. Despite her claims of innocence regarding the heist, she conceded her knowledge of the plot. She acknowledged providing the kitchen timers for the bomb and being near the bank during the robbery. Moreover, she implicated Wells, the deceased delivery driver, as a participant rather than a mere victim and identified Rothstein, the individual who reported Roden's murder and her former accomplice, as the brains behind the operation. This revelation painted a complex picture of intertwined relationships and roles within the infamous collar bomb heist. As Deal Armstrong attempted to shift blame to Rothstein, her admissions inadvertently implicated her further in the collar bomb plot. Even before she offered information that incriminated herself, investigators were already leaning towards the theory that she played a central role in orchestrating the heist. This suspicion was bolstered by accounts from four informants who had come forward over the weeks, sharing that Deal Armstrong had discussed the crime with detailed knowledge. Notably, one informant had documented conversations wherein Deal Armstrong claimed she eliminated Roden because he threatened to expose the robbery plot and admitted to sizing Wells's neck for the bomb. The investigation took a significant turn in late 2005, a few months after Deal Armstrong's initial discussions with federal agents. A new witness emerged, revealing the involvement of Kenneth Barnes, a former television repairman turned drug dealer, who was an acquaintance of Deal Armstrong. Barnes, known to have spoken indiscreetly about the plot, was betrayed by his brother-in-law, while already detained on drug-related offenses. Faced with the possibility of additional prison time, Barnes cooperated with authorities, agreeing to disclose the full extent of his knowledge about the crime in return for a lighter sentence. This development underscored the complex web of connections and the depth of planning behind the notorious collar bomb case. Barnes's testimony reinforced the investigator's suspicion that Deal Armstrong orchestrated the collar bomb heist, revealing her motive was to finance a hit on her father, whom she accused of squandering the family wealth she hoped to inherit. Despite Barnes's claim of being partially out of the loop, his narrative aligned significantly with the evidence gathered by federal agents propelling the investigation forward. On February 10, 2006, when confronted by the FBI with the prospect of indictment, Deal Armstrong's reaction was explosive. In anger, she vehemently protested against the allegations to the agents and her 
lawyer, yet paradoxically she continued engaging with them, even participating in a drive around Erie to identify her whereabouts during the bank robbery. However, her cooperation abruptly halted, demanding immunity for further disclosures. By then, her extensive dialogues with the agents had irrevocably implicated her, demonstrating a classic case of revealing too much information. In July 2007, nearly four years after the Erie bank heist, a significant announcement was made by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Erie, highlighting a crucial turning point in the case. U.S. Attorney Mary Beth Buchanan addressed the media, revealing that the investigation had concluded. Deal Armstrong and Barnes were formally accused of orchestrating the complex crime. Deal Armstrong was identified as the mastermind behind the operation. The charges also implicated additional co-conspirators, including Rothstein and Wells, who were initially viewed as victims. The indictment resulted from extensive investigative work involving over a thousand police interviews. It presented a narrative that Wells had participated in the plot from its inception, believing he was to rob the bank with a decoy bomb. The elaborate scavenger hunt was devised as a cover story intended to mislead law enforcement. Wells was led to believe that, should he be apprehended, the detailed instructions would serve as proof of his coercion, suggesting he was an unwilling participant acting under duress. This revelation challenged the initial perception of Wells' role in the heist, adding complexity to an already perplexing case. Over time, Buchanan's statement illuminated a dark transition in Brian Wells's role within the plot. Initially considered a co-conspirator, Wells was trapped in a deadly reality, his earlier participation becoming a dire predicament. The supposed dummy bomb secured around his neck was in fact genuine, transforming a planned deception into a desperate struggle for survival. This revelation left many people who were closely following the case deeply dissatisfied, raising more questions than answers. Skeptics wondered about Wells's reasons for engaging in the heist whether he was aware of the imminent risk, and if Deal Armstrong, despite her psychological disorders, was capable of orchestrating such a sophisticated crime. The case's complexity only intensified when it was disclosed that the FBI regarded the entire scavenger hunt to be nothing but a charade designed to distract. The bomb's design ensured it would detonate if tampered with, indicating that Wells's fate was sealed from the beginning. In September 2008, Barnes admitted his guilt regarding his involvement in the conspiracy and related weapons charges, receiving a 45-year prison sentence. He agreed to testify against her, hoping for a sentence reduction. The trial was anticipated to shed light on the lingering questions surrounding the collar bomb case. However, clarity was postponed due to her legal proceedings encountering significant delays. Initially, a federal judge declared her mentally incompetent for trial. Later, after being deemed competent, her trial was further delayed due to a diagnosis of glandular cancer, leading to another pause as her medical outlook was determined. In August 2010, it was estimated she had three to seven years left to live. Despite these challenges, the decision was made to proceed with the trial, which was rescheduled for October 12th. Douglas Sugru, Deal Armstrong's attorney, decided to allow her to testify. Given her previous self-incriminating statements and volatile and unpredictable nature, this strategy appeared risky. The choice to let her speak on her behalf sparked debate over the wisdom of exposing such a complex and erratic personality to cross-examination and jury scrutiny. On the fifth day of the trial at the Erie Federal Courthouse, Ken Barnes became a pivotal figure in the courtroom drama. The prosecution, led by the eloquent and experienced assistant U.S. attorney, Marshall Piccinini, had already laid a solid foundation for their case against Deal Armstrong. Piccinini characterized the group involved in the Wells plot as a twisted, intellectually bright, dysfunctional ensemble who ultimately outwitted themselves. His argument was bolstered by testimonies from seven former inmates who relayed damaging admissions made by Deal Armstrong. Barnes, with his history as a drug dealer and would-be assassin, emerged as the prosecution's key witness. His testimony was highly anticipated and expected to provide a comprehensive account of the events leading to the robbery on August 28, 2003. Despite his appearance, marred by the physical toll of his past addiction, Barnes presented his testimony with a straightforwardness that enthralled the jury. His account aimed to unravel the complex web of the conspiracy, shedding light on the intricate details of the plot and the roles of those involved. Barnes testified that Deal Armstrong was the scheme's architect, recruiting accomplices, including Rothstein, to execute her plan. Enticed by the prospect of financial gain, Wells became involved in the plot. Unknown to many, 
the seemingly unassuming pizza delivery man had entangled himself in risky behaviors, including a transactional relationship with a prostitute fueled by crack cocaine that was obtained with Barnes's assistance. This precarious lifestyle led Wells into debt with his drug suppliers, increasing his desperation for money. According to Barnes, it was only on the day of the robbery, upon delivering pizzas to the secluded TV transmission tower, that Wells discovered the true peril of his situation. Attempting to flee, he was forcibly subdued, and the bomb was secured around his neck. Under the threat of violence, throughout Barnes's account, Deal Armstrong interrupted with outbursts, accusing him of lying, adding tension to the already charged atmosphere in the court. Courtroom. On October 26, 2010, Deal Armstrong was granted the moment to convey her perspective to the court. Over two days amounting to five and a half hours, she dominated the courtroom with her presence. Her appearance was disheveled, her black hair unkempt, framing her face as she delivered a relentless stream of narratives. In a lengthy speech, lasting around an hour and 45 minutes, she referenced Brian Wells only once, and she would separate herself from any prior knowledge or involvement with him. I never met Brian Wells, and I never knew Brian Wells. I became aware of him the day that he died. I saw it on the news. After extensive deliberation, which lasted 11 hours, the jury, comprising seven women and five men, found Deal Armstrong guilty on all counts. Armed bank robbery, conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery, and using a destructive device during a crime of violence. The convictions opened the possibility of a life sentence at her sentencing, scheduled for February 28th, marking a significant conclusion to a case that had captured public attention with its complexity and the tragic narrative at its core. Seven years after the crime, while many considered the case closed with the conviction of Marjorie Deal Armstrong, Jim Fisher held a different perspective. As a retired FBI criminal investigator turned criminal justice professor, Fisher was deeply intrigued by the collar bomb case from the moment he witnessed footage of Brian Wells in distress. His fascination with unsolved crimes drew him to this complex and shocking incident, prompting an exhaustive review of all available information. Fisher dedicated himself to examining the media reports and scrutinizing every detail of evidence made public by the FBI. Through his investigation, Fisher arrived at a conclusion that starkly contrasted with the official narrative. He firmly believed that Deal Armstrong was not the mastermind behind the elaborate and deadly bank robbery plot. Jim Fisher's skepticism about Marjorie Deal Armstrong's role in the collar bomb heist is reinforced by his interpretation of a profile created by the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit. This profile suggests the crime extended far beyond a simple bank robbery, orchestrated by an individual referred to as Collar Bomber, who seemed more invested in the theatricality and manipulation of the event than in the robbery itself. According to the FBI's analysis, the crime was meticulously planned, with the perpetrator directing others based on a predetermined script, aiming to control the situation remotely. The complexity and deliberate construction of the crime led the Behavioral Analysis Unit to conclude that the motivations behind the heist were multifaceted, with financial gain not being the primary objective. This perspective posits that the orchestrator of the heist sought to create an intricate and enigmatic puzzle that would perplex authorities and observers alike for years. The real intent was to engage law enforcement in a futile chase for answers, mirroring the futile and fatal scavenger hunt forced upon Wells. Jim Fisher's analysis challenges the prevailing narrative, focusing on Bill Rothstein rather than Marjorie Deal Armstrong as the mastermind behind the collar bomb plot. Fisher's reasoning is rooted in the FBI's behavioral profile of the bomb builder, which describes an individual adept with tools, economical in using materials, and proud of their craftsmanship. These traits align closely with what is known about Rothstein, a skilled handyman known for his ability to create and construct various items. Rothstein's actions post-robbery further fuel Fisher's suspicions. By initiating the 911 call that led to Deal Armstrong's implication in the Roden murder, Rothstein effectively controlled the narrative and and direction of the investigation. This move deflected attention away from himself and ensured that if he didn't act, one of the other conspirators might expose him. His voluntary cooperation with the police, coupled with his insistence on his ignorance about the collar bomb plot, was perceived by Fisher as a strategic attempt to appear innocent. 
Rothstein's strategy, as Fisher suggests, was to create a diversion, misleading investigators with a complex scavenger hunt mirroring the one Wells was forced to undertake. This approach wasted critical investigative resources in the immediate aftermath of the crime. Rothstein's deathbed denials only added to the mystery, leaving unanswered questions about his true level of involvement. Jim Fisher characterizes Bill Rothstein as a master manipulator who sought to cement his legacy through an intricate crime that would gain global attention and confound law enforcement indefinitely. Rothstein's aim, according to Fisher, wasn't just to commit a crime but to craft a puzzle that would underscore his intellect. By selecting accomplices, he could dominate and deliberately withhold key aspects of the plan. Rothstein would guarantee the plot's complexity and the bewilderment on the case. This approach ineffectively left a trail filled with misdirection and incomplete information, making it difficult for authorities to piece together the full scope of the conspiracy. Fisher believes Rothstein achieved a posthumous victory, dying as the keeper of the plot's deepest secrets and evading any accountability. His death sealed the fate of the investigation, leaving behind a legacy of secrecy and confusion as well as frustration. According to Fisher, Rothstein's final act was one of ultimate control. By taking the truth to his grave, he not only avoided justice, but also left a lasting imprint of chaos, leaving those involved to grapple with the unresolved complexities of the case. In this view, Rothstein's success lies not in the notoriety of the crime itself, but in the enduring enigma and the endless array of unanswered questions that followed his death. Well, that is going to conclude this video. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the collar bomb bank heist, make sure to hit that like button, leave a comment with your thoughts. If you have a topic suggestion, please send it to the email in the description. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more bizarre stories just like this. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.